Hi, my name is Renee Howell. Um, I work at the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, ACES, um, as a program officer. And one of the programs that I oversee is NASEF. And today we are working on our ninth out of 10th webinar in this series about NASEF. So our specific topic today is going to be looking at presenting research. Um, these are gonna be some tips and tricks for your students. So if you are here on behalf of your students and you want them to watch this later, please feel free to show them the recording uh, because this is specifically geared toward them. The next webinar will also be ge geared towards them. So just as a heads up in that regard. And the things that we're gonna to cover today in our webinar are how to organize the poster, the judging rubric, and then I'll go over some interview tips for our students. So the step one, um, how to organize your poster. This is gonna go over some of the key tips for um, graphics, for layouts, and for decorating. So a general template um, is here. The idea is that you have all the key components of the information that the students are gonna to need to talk over. When the students are presenting, they are welcome to have their notebooks with them. However, obviously they can't fit all of their research onto the poster. So the notebook is there mostly for them. If the judges wanna flip through it, it's also available for the judges to be able to do that. However, we do want them to have the main components on their poster board, of course. So we want them to have their purpose, their hypothesis and background information. These are really important for them. We want them to have their abstracts and materials and procedures. We one thing I will say is that you don't want the materials and procedures to take up a ton of space on the poster board. You want to keep that pretty concise as there is going to, to be presumably a lot more information that the students are going to need to have on there that is going to be more important for the judges to see, like their data. Visuals are great if they have a really intense project or something that's um, really high level. Visuals are a really great way for them to convey that information to the judges without taking up a ton of space on their poster board. Um, you'll also have a section for results and discussion, conclusion, and then um, this is new this year. In previous years, the International Science and Engineering Fair did not permit acknowledgments, but students are allowed this year to acknowledge any people that have helped them with their project. Um, so they can acknowledge their family if they want, they can acknowledge their mentors. Um, and then they'll also want to include any background research bibliography citations on the poster board as well. Yes, I see you've included abstract in the center of the, the project board. Uh, traditionally at, at ISEF, it's put on the side. Yeah, they've changed the formatting a little bit this year. There are a few differences. They are welcome to move these around. This is just the key things that we want them to have on the poster board. If they find that they can set it up in a different way that flows a little bit better for how they're planning to present, they're welcome to do that. Thank you for that question, Sean. This might be very elementary of me. Um, this is my first year. I always want my students to draw things on their own as much as possible, handwrite things on their own. I don't want them just printing a bunch of crap off the internet and pasting it on their boards. I think that is way too impersonal. It looks too um, just copied and pasted for lack of, I, I can't think of what I'm trying to say, but you, you know what I'm trying to say. Like they just sort of copied and pasted everything that they did. It doesn't look to me, it doesn't look like they did any work. They just printed it all off the internet, slapped it on a board and took it up there. And they get real ticked at me for that. But I want to see their blood, sweat and tears on the project. And so is that, is that sort of elementary to go to something like this? I mean, is that going to cost them points if I sort of make them keep doing it that way because it maybe won't look as professional or th does that make sense like I don't want yeah. I don't want to hold them back but I also want them to be invested too and not take the easy road just because they can absolutely I appreciate that, that perspective sense. Stephanie um so I will say that um, things like the purpose, the hypothesis, the background research, that's probably going to want to be typed up and printed just to keep it looking very cohesive and to make sure that it's legible for the judges. But if you want to make sure that your students are doing like hands on work in terms of interpreting the data, definitely have them um, like draw diagrams and tables and do their own graphs. 
rather than having them input it into like Excel and print that out. You are right. absolutely welcome to have them do that. I think if you keep it in the data section, it one gets right. them to engage with the data a little bit more and forces right. them to think about what the implications of the data are. And it also has them putting that like hands-on touch to the poster itself. All right, some tips for the poster. You want the title to be big enough for the judges to read from about 10 feet away. So we want the title obviously to be big, typed as best. Um, typically we're aiming for about a 16-ish size font to make sure again it is legible. It also makes the poster look more consistent, which is why we encourage this. Um, this one is very important. Make sure tables and graphs are labeled. Even if the students are generating them the cells, there needs to be like a little caption at the bottom. And I'll show you what that looks like here in a moment, but this is very important. Judges will be keeping an eye out for this. Um, and that is one way that students can lose points on their poster itself is if their tables and graphs are not labeled. So that's a big one. Um, as I said, please use a minimum of 16 point font. Um, that's just so the judges can read it from about four or five feet away. Photos are great. We love photos. Um, and students are welcome to decorate their posters. You just wanna make sure that it isn't covering up any important information or making it difficult to read. And I will show a few examples of what this will look like or what it could look like on the next slide. All right, for the labeling um, of graphs and photos, x-axis, we want to be the independent variable, y-axis dependent variable. Make sure they have units, please. Um, they are going to talk the judges through most of the graphics when they're doing the interview. Um, but we want the judges to be able to get the gist of the information without having to ask the questions. Theoretically, a judge could look at the kid's poster, read it over, and get all the key information that they need to about the experimentation. You will also title graphs and photos based on the order that they appear. An example of this is here. So it says figure one. So this tells us that it is the first graphic to show up on the poster board that we are looking at. And then it gives us an idea. So we can see that the X and Y axis are both labeled. They both have units. Um, and then it gives us a rough idea of what the student was looking for and what the experiment was when they collected this data. And then our examples for how to decorate. Of course, students are welcome to go away from this type, but it gives you an idea of some of the ways that students have historically decorated their posters. One of the ways is to have a very colorful background and some cool borders. Um, another thing is if your students are working on their poster boards and they're realizing that the title is taking up too much space, they can do what this student did and kind of take another piece of paper and put it above the rest of the poster board. So the poster board will fold up nice and then the title will be kind of sticking up. And this is just to create more space for the student to be able to put their important information on the poster. Another really good way to include a little bit more creativity is to put colored paper behind the actual text. It just makes the poster board look a little bit more interesting while still making sure that the judges can readily read the information. Fun border colors um, are also really helpful. And then even something as elaborate as this, if students really wanna get into it and go like thematic with how they decorate their poster, that is totally okay. Um, one key thing I will point out with this example is that notice that there are no actual drawings or none of the little stars on where the writing is. Again, we want to make sure that even if the kids are being as creative as possible, that all that key information is legible and readily available to our judges. All right, our judging rubric. So we'll go over the criteria and the scoring. Um, don't worry, this will all be available to you all. So please do not panic. It is going to be a solid bit of information. So how the judges score. So we have six criteria. Each of the criteria is scored on a one through five scale, and then they have a weight attached to them. Okay, so our first criteria is their research question that has a weight of two. So they're scored on a one through five. So say that your student gets a three in the research question, they get three out of five, that'll give them six points. So you take the raw score and multiply it by the weight to get the total points. Um, in total, students can earn up to 100 points. Um, and that is assuming, again, that they get scores of fives on everything. Our second criteria is design and methodology. That has a weight of three. Project execution is the next. And creativity and imagination. Those both have weights of four. 
The display of the poster has a weight of two, and then their interview skills have a weight of five. So notice that the highest scored criteria here are going to be one, their interview skills, that is the highest out of everything, and then tied in second place are the project execution and their creativity and imagination. Okay, and we're going to go through each of these criteria individually, um, but I just want to give you all an idea of how everything stacks up together. So our first criteria is the research question. Again, this has a weight of two. So the first four criteria are gonna be broken up with a science category and then an engineering category. On the left-hand side of the screen, these are the fives. So this is what a five on the one through five scale would look like on the le left-hand side, sorry. Left-hand side is a five, right-hand side is a one. So these are the two extremes of the score scale. Out of five for science, your students will provide a clearly articulated research question, focused purpose statement, and contributions to the field of study. The scientific method presented in study is sound and clearly testable. For an engineering category five, you would have, um, it provides a clear description of a practical need or problem to be solved, thoroughly descriptive definition of criteria for proposed solution, detailed explanation of constraints. So these are the fives on the opposite end of the spectrum at a one in the science category for the research question. It does not provide a purpose or provides one that is unclear or disorganized, does not identify a contribution to the field of study, or is not able to be tested using sound scientific method. Engineering at a one would fail to provide a description of a practical need or problem to be solved, or provides one that is unclear, fails to define the criteria for proposed solution, or defines it incorrectly lacks explanation of constraints. So again, this is showing you the two extremes of that score scale. Um, because there is so much text involved in all of the criteria, I'm only gonna be reading the five score from here on out, but the rubric will be provided to you all um, and these slides will be provided. So feel free to take a look at the score of one at a later time, but just for the sake of being respectful of everybody's time today, I'm only gonna be reading the fives. Design and methodology, this has a weight of three. And at the five scale for science, it will provide a well-designed plan with clear data collection methods, variables and controls are explicitly described, appropriate and complete. As described, the experimental design would be easily replicated from the information provided. For engineering at a score of five, it would provide an extensive exploration of alternatives to answer a need or problem, clear and advanced identification of a solution, skillful development of a high quality prototype. Project execution, this is one of our big ones. So this has a weight of four. On the science, um, it would provide clear systematic data collection and analysis, reproducibility of results, appropriate application of mathematical and statistical methods, sufficient data collected to support interpretation and conclusions. For engineering at a score of five, it would provide a prototype that specifically demonstrates intended design the prototype has been thoroughly tested in multiple conditions and trials, and the prototype just demonstrates engineering skills and completeness. Creativity and imagination, these ones are combined, so it applies to both science and engineering. And this is another one that is high on our scale. It is also a four. Science and engineering will both clearly demonstrate imagination and inventiveness. It'll offer a new perspective that opens up possibilities or new alternatives. Display of poster. This has a weight of two, so it's on the lower end. Um, for both science and engineering, out of five, it will provide a clearly articulated and logical organization of material and display of supporting documentation. Excellent use of graphics and legends. Um, so again, things that they're gonna be looking at are legibility and how well the students organize their data and making sure that they have graphics that are labeled. And then the last one that I think got cut off again. It did not. Um, is there interview skills? This is the most highly weighted of all of our criteria. This is the one that we're going to want to stress for our students. And after I go over this, we will go over a few tips and tricks um, for your students in terms of their interview skills. At A5 for interview skills, um, it will provide a very clear, concise, thoughtful response to questions. They will understand the basic relevant basic science relevant to the project, understand the interpretation and limitations of the results and conclusions. They will demonstrate independence in conducting the project. They will recognize the potential impact in science, society, and or economics. Provides quality of ideas for further research. 
team projects, if you have folks that are working in teams, judges will be looking for whether or not all of the members are contributing. So that is a key one. If you have students that are competing in teams, they will be judged on whether or not everybody is contributing equally um, when they are being judged during the interview section. So again, that is interview skills out of five. Um, so these are some tips and what to expect. I'm gonna give some examples of questions that the judges may ask, that way you all know and your students know what is in store for them. General tips, judges will be asking probing questions. They wanna understand what, uh, that students understand their project inside and out. Um, they will also really want students to connect to the bigger picture. So if you notice in the judging rubric for the interview skills, it does say that they want to know what the like social, cultural, economic impacts could be of the student's project. Um, so at a really high level, you want your students to be able to understand what their research could do. Making eye contact and greeting interviewers, um, uh, the judges are gonna wanna make personal contact with the students. So just practicing doing a solid introduction, solid handshake would be a good idea. Don't chew gum while interviewing. Um, there have been incidences where gum has fallen out of students' mouths while they were talking to the judges, and that is embarrassing for everybody involved. So strongly encourage students not to chew gum. And if students seem enthusiastic about their topic, judges are likely to notice that, and that'll probably get them a higher score on the um, interview skills as well. Questions that the judges may ask. Um, things like, why do you think that would happen? Um, specifically looking at the beginning stages of the research. When the students are talking about their hypothesis, judges are likely to interject here and ask why the student thought that that would be the conclusion they would get. What are your independent and dependent variables? We want our students to be able to understand where they had to control the experiment and that sort of thing. Where did you get this idea? So um, especially for things like our Native American Heritage Award, this is gonna be really important. If there's a cultural tie-in that the students are using, that's the kind of information that our um, judges are looking. What does that graph tell you? They're gonna want the students to interpret the data that they collected for them. What did you base that conclusion on? So as students are presenting their findings, they're gonna want the students to be able to pull in the data and the proof how they got there. Why or how are your findings important? Again, tying into that big picture, and then if you had to do it all over again, is there anything you would do differently? Um, this is especially one if you have students that are doing engineering experiments, this is likely to be one that the judges are gonna ask, um, especially because in the engineering practice, you're iterating constantly. Um, and if you're building a prototype, they're gonna wanna know why students made the changes that they did. And that is all of the information I had prepared. Do folks have any questions about the content that I went over today, the judging rubric, what to expect at NASEF. I will say also, this is probably something that people don't think about, but it happened to me at Lego uh, Robotics. One of my kids had their cell phones on during their interview. <laughs> and I, they don't let the coach go in the room with them when they're being interviewed on their innovation project. And so my kids were in there being interviewed and they were nailing it. And then one of their phones went off and wham, just knocked them out. And they came out with their heads just down. And I was like, what happened? And the judge asked to see me in there. And he was like, they had a perfect 4.0 and then their phone went off. He said, it's just a hard lesson they had to learn. And he said, I let them have it pretty hard but they had a really strong, you know, presentation. So they really had to learn that lesson the hard, you know, the hard way. And the parent that went in there with them to video, she was like, you could see it on their faces. The, and the kid whose cell phone went off was like, oh man, like he was like ready for the firing squad, but they don't think about those things, you know, cause they're, hyped up they're excited they forgot they had their phone in their pocket mm -hmm. or whatever and it's just devastating whenever that something like that happens so that's just something that I will always check from <laughs> now on because I didn't even think of it either but that is a great point thank you Stephanie yes definitely make sure your students have their cell phones on silent or off or even like collect them before they walk into the judging room 